starting with the story. This is David Hilbert. He is probably the most badass mathematician of the turn of the century, but not because of the numerous things that he contributed to math. We'll talk about that later. The reason I want to talk about him right now is because he talked a lot of shit. Um, for example, he had a uh, physicist colleague who came to him with a problem one day and said, hey, I can't solve this. Could you help me out with it? But he looked him dead in the eye and he said, you know what the problem is? Is that physics is too hard for physicists. <laughs> so, um, he also had a student at one point. He, uh, he, you know, he supervised PhD students and he, uh, his supervisor came to him one day and he uh, said to him, hey, your student dropped out. He went to go be a poet. And so Hilbert says, good, he didn't have enough math or imagination to be a mathematician anyway. Yeah, he talked a lot of shit. So the reason I brought this up is really more because... The reason this is funny, the reason his stories carry through on history is that it's totally juxtaposed against what you expect mathematicians to be. So you think of mathematicians and people think of this. Right? It's... it's People don't look like this, right? And whereas in other historical figures, you see all sorts of passion and struggle and all sorts of things that are associated with them, but in the field of math, I mean, who can really name more than three mathematicians in this room, right? So um, the idea of this presentation is that I want to humanize math in a way that hasn't been done on a massive scale, because too many people say things like, oh, I'm not a math person. Or, oh, I hated math in school, or, and you know, they, they say these things and it's very acceptable, and whereas if somebody came up to me and said, oh, well, you know, I never tried expressing myself, I'm not that kind of person, <laughs> we'd probably smack them. So, um, that's the idea. So starting off with some eccentric geniuses, Paul Erdes. When Paul Erdes was three years old, he used to ask people how old they were and then he'd calculate how many seconds they've been alive for, and come up to them and be like, you've been alive for 32 million whatever whatever seconds. And they'd look at him because he was three, and it was ridiculous. But, uh, <laughs> so he grew up to be the most prolific mathematician of all time. He published more papers than anyone in history. 1,475 independent, different, original, new results with 511 different people. If you divide that into his life, he published an academic paper every two weeks. So, that's pretty intense. And how does he accomplish something like that? Well, he was completely homeless. He owned nothing. He literally wandered the earth, knocking on mathematicians' doors and saying, Hey, I want to sleep on your couch and prove a theorem with you. He's fucking Paul Erdes, so what are you going to say? You're going to invite him in, you're going to give him a beer and some dinner, and he's going to sleep on your couch. And, you know, he said, another proof, another proof. It was his big famous thing. But literally, he would not bring anything with him. He'd show up with a brown paper bag, and no clothes, and no toothbrush, and no nothing, and, and people just took care of him, because that's how gangster he was. Um, so, one thing that mathematicians love doing, because this guy, they love this guy so much, is that um, they have this thing called the Airdash number, which is kind of like a Kevin Bacon number, because he published with so many different people. You know, so zero is Paul Airdash. You get a one if you wrote a paper with Paul Airdash. You get a two if you wrote a paper with somebody who wrote a paper with Paul Erdős, and you get a three if you know you wrote a paper with somebody, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And like universities on their like department websites will like brag about how many staff members they have with like an Erdős number of two or one. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Um, so other things he brought to math. I mean, he had sort of a weird lingo about him. He used to call God the supreme fascist because he said he kept all of the good mathematical proofs to himself. <laughs>
turn of the century, he posed 23 big unsolved problems to the International Congress of Mathematicians. And he was a huge leader in the mathematical community. He unified a lot of people who were sort of working independently and said, hey, let's set some goals, let's work together. And so he set these 23 problems and it really set the tone for all of mathematics for that century. So in the course of the century, all of them were proved except for one. Um, so the Clay Mathematics Institute decided that we're gonna make seven new problems, well not new, but the most important problems in mathematics, the shit that if you proved it, the world would change, like hover cars and like lack of internet security. <laughs> so they posed these problems, and they placed a million dollar reward on each one. And um, only one of them has been solved so far. Woo! That's the Poincaré conjecture. And I bet you don't really care what it is, but in, you know, layman's sort of construction, if you take a rubber band, and put it around an apple, as you can see in this picture, you can sort of shrink it to a single point without breaking the rubber band or getting off the surface, right? Whereas if you do that with a donut, can't do it because you'll sort of like snap the donut in half or snap the rubber band in half. Um, this Poincaré conjecture is that this also works in four dimensions. And the reasons why that's important are long and complicated, but anyways, the guy who proved this is a little bit more interesting. This guy. <laughs> So he proved the Poincaré conjecture. Um, a bit of an eccentric. This is sort of like the big mathematical breakthrough of the year, right? So he got awarded all these things, like a Fields Medal and the Mathematical Society Prize and a million dollar Millennium Prize and all that. The Fields Medal is like the Nobel Prize of math. Like they give them out like every four years. It's a big deal. So, you know, he declined all of them. He said, I don't want them. And the original, original reason he gave for this, he said, these people on these prize committees are not qualified to judge my work. Even they are not on my level. And then he ranted about the, like, the lack of integrity in mathematics and stuff. He quit his job, moved into his mom's house, and has never touched mathematics since. But he's a genius. Story. All right, so um, one of the things that kind of goes along with this is that like he's in this world where he thinks there's a lack of integrity in math. He's sort of angry because the Fields Medal was given to this guy he thought didn't deserve it. Um, so inevitably, there will be feuds in the world of mathematics. The most ancient of which, Pythagoras and Hypatius. They were fighting over, well, it's really one incident, actually. They were fighting over whether the square root of two is irrational, sort of going back to the pi presentation. Pythagoras, on one hand, had this cult of numbers where he believed everything in the universe was tied together by, like, perfect ratios, like two divided by six and 720 divided by 422, like perfect integer fractions and the relationship between everything, music, planets, could be communicated this way. Um, then a follower of his sort of cult religion came along and proved that the square root of two is actually irrational and can never, no matter how many years you spend trying to find that fraction, be expressed as a fraction of integers. So Pythagoras, his whole life work, his whole worldview is torn apart and he drowns the guy. <laughs> so Pythagoras, who you know Pythagorean theorem, right? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. He murdered a dude. 